Okay, so we're starting the presentation just with a little interactive activity about what is culture. So with your mobile phone, some of you have already answered, so we can see the answers here. Um, later on, if more of you add, we can click on a Wordle and create a word cloud to see what um, language comes up in this. So we'll leave that to now. And the reason why we asked you what is culture is that we're finding with this project we, it's more and more difficult to define. And uh, it's more and more difficult to find uh, models which reflect what culture is to all of us. So for that reason, we decided to ask you as well to see what you think. Um, what is Mexico? We are going to talk about Mexico. And we've swapped round because Beatrice wants us to go first, but she's going to contribute to this as well. But in a minute, she will stand up and, and do something. Uh, and uh, welcome to Beatrice from Mexico and her friend Angelica, who is here with us too. And what, what happened was, we, Beatrice and us have uh, an interest for special concepts and uh, epistemologies and ontologies. And with the current audience, you can be, be all right with your epistemologies and ontologies, so we're all fine on that. Because we didn't know what kind of audience we would get, whether too many students or not. And so we have students and staff uh, from Mexico uh, talking to us, and we set up a virtual learning environment, VLE, from, uh, with the help of uh, Michelle Jackman, the learning technologist. And what we do, uh, we're trying to have student-driven content design that students share. So instead of telling the students what we wanted them to do, we decided to let them free to roam the environment and exchange ideas. And then from that, we would then encourage them to do activities. However, there was one thing we asked them to do, which was uh, introduce themselves. So uh, over to Gwenola on how this was created. Thank you. So this is the home page. Um, as um, you can see from the screenshot, this might look like a traditional Moodle page, but it's actually uh, situated in the applied research area. So it's Moodle supported. Uh, we actually had um, a learning technology set up for the page. Um, you might also see uh, that we've got here two appellations, Mexico Language Exchange and Mexico Intercultural Exchange. Uh, we decided to keep it like this to, just to show you uh, the shift that we had with the natural evolution of um, the project from just concentrating on language to the actual intercultural exchange. Um, you might also be aware, some of you know already, that um, this project is uh, now trilingual. We've got three languages here, English, Spanish, and, uh, and French. Um, the reason why we did that, when we um, introduced the project to our students in uh, 100 Dell, uh, the French students felt a little bit disengaged, thinking that they couldn't really contribute contribute properly to the project, uh, not being able to use the language that they're here to study. Um, when we talked to our partners uh, in Mexico, we realized that uh, students actually learn uh, French as well over there, so we decided then uh, to add um, French elements um, to this project. So I translated um, what we've got here in French, and our students are contributed in the three languages. Um, so we'll, um, we'll continue with Marina. Or oh, Beatrice, so she wants to read her own bit. Beatrice, do you want to just read yeah, what? The, the first aim is to develop intercultural communicative competence with learner-centered collaborative, collaborative, sorry, I'm losing my English. <laughs> <laughs> collaborative online learning. And this comes from my dissertation. The study of modern languages and cultures should include the identification of the learner to enable them to make sense of their experience in a foreign language and culture. And congratulations to Dr. Pira Lopez, yes. who got her PhD yesterday in Nottingham. So thank you very much, Beatrice, for that. So we really like together, we like this idea of the learner as agent. And they also the staff, you know, we are all becoming agents in this process. And we try to, uh, as staff, we want to embrace the postmodern, post-method approach, which means uh, we want to see what the local context is, the local needs, and we try to address the transformational learning experience of all agents involved um, in meta-reflective mode, including ourselves. We are changing, we think. 
we are changing our vision. Elwin will conclude with this reflection, which will show that to you. Yes, yeah, so in, linked to this then, aim two is really to focus on this exchange. And it's quite new because there have been um, commun computer mediating communication before, which is com CMC is still the most used term. So it's still what is used for this kind. Even if we use uh, tablets, we use mobile phones, it's still CMC. Uh, but people like Rubin who came to talk to us from the University of New York, um, he called it global network learning. In Europe, uh, people like O'Dowd is quite big on this, Poliska from Manchester, Gus and Helm, Open University. They talk about telecollaboration. Um, and we are now possibly verging more towards that, the central one, the Rubin definition. However, in the literature, it's still CMC. Uh, most of the literature is still, still calls it that, even if it is quite a horrid term. So linked to that, we have um, then a link to the threshold concepts. Is intercultural awareness a threshold concept? And does the engagement with multilingual <coughs> multiliteracies enhance this intercultural awareness or, or not? Because, you know, we're also finding that perhaps not. Um, and can this exchange help us with internationalizing our curriculum? The British part of the curriculum, although there are some things which are international, is still very much British-centered. We're trying to show students different ways of doing things. And we, we've managed to, to a certain extent. Sorry, next one. So now, Zoe will carry on with why as well this links with our uni's mission statement. Okay, so my role in the project started off as a student on the master's programme, and I was also a member of the Global Leaders Programme. So my background comes from the international business world, moving into the classroom. Um, at Coventry University, we have this idea of a global graduate, and it's part of the mission statement that they become a dynamic international um, student graduate in the international field and the community of learning. Um, I found from um, my classes here, especially as a teacher now, that the students come in from their own countries and they tend to sit in their own little cultures. So the idea that we want a commentary is to merge these cultures because this will help in their global um, employment skills. Hopefully, like, we're going to produce graduates that go into the world, world of work and they can put, perform all these tasks interculturally. Um, okay, so the reason for the project is based on this part of the mission statement, and we took the basis from um, Byram and Griffcover and the Council of Europe, and they started off with um, intercultural communicative competence by Byram, and they looked at ways to develop the teachers to help produce these students and to develop their intercultural communicative competence using digital literacies and um, their, their graduate competences. Okay, so I'll now push on to Gwenola, who's going to do the French part. <laughs> French, French Byron. <laughs> so Byron studied in France. He's now influential here in England, but back in France as well. He's, for example, studied uh, in Université Paris-Descartes. Um, he really insists on the fact that when we need to understand how another culture works, we need to develop... Uh, a conscience, we need to develop an intercultural conscience. So he's added the philosophical elements uh, to maybe what was not done before. Um, and you've got different levels to gain this understanding of, um, of this culture. You've got knowledge, savoir, intercultural attitudes, savoir être, skills of interpreting and relating, savoir comprendre, Discovering and interaction, savoir apprendre, cultural awareness, savoir s'engager. You've got these different levels. And you've got first savoir, savoir which is knowledge. Some of you uh, might see the difference for people who speak French here between savoir, the first savoir, and the second savoir. The first savoir being just knowledge as a noun. Um, here we've got, and he really emphasizes on the fact that we need to gain the knowledge of ourselves, our own culture, and the other culture before undertaking any intercultural project. Uh, we, we need to bear in mind, though, uh, our individual differences as well. Um, then, only then, can you move on to savoir-être, which is knowing how to be, knowing how to behave uh, when you are going to be 
uh, dealing, dealing with another culture. So you've got this personal sphere. After this, you can move on to savoir comprendre, knowing how to understand, knowing how to understand um, issues that maybe are related to your culture and the other culture. After that, you get, you've got that understanding of the personal sphere, you've got an understanding of the context of the culture, then, only then, can you move on to savoir apprendre and savoir s'engager, which are knowing how to learn and how to get involved. So then, you know how to get and how to react when you're facing the other culture, but when you are communicating on a daily basis. For instance, for this project, when you are communicating in real time. But, uh, Zoe, you have um, a critique of Byron. Okay. And I have the microphone, so I have to keep switching around. All right. <laughs> okay. So one of the critiques we found of Byron's model was that it lacked a metacognitive strategies. Um, these include knowledge, conceptions, and convictions regarding your own cognitive um, function. So it helps you to um, develop where you can plan, direct, and evaluate your own learning process. Um, further critiques were that this was created in the 90s. Um, it did not contemplate um, the network ICC that it's developing now. It was a very much Eurocentric approach and include um, the the transfer of students from countries and placements, um, which we, we don't have at the moment. So we've taken the project into a um, global perspective. And one of the thing, ideas that came up from the exchange was, was about culture and whose culture, and looking at stereotypes and reanalyzing um, what means of culture. So the project started in May and um, was a pilot stage. From May to July, um, the students all posted on the introduction forum, and then after this date, we took out the exchanges and put them into Excel and Envivo for analysis of themes that were being discussed. We found that um, a lot of the themes, um, it was all left to grow organically, so a lot of the themes started with introductions, talked about typical dislikes, daily routines, music, sports. But one of the main things was that the Mexican students were talking about their city and their country and their culture. And when they spoke to the students in Coventry, they were not getting the same kind of replies. So we looked at this. Um, we also, one of the problems was at this time of year, all of the Coventry students had left for the term. So there was quite a lot of frustration from the Mexican students that some of their postings were not being responded to. However, we gave them a survey um, a couple of months ago to see how they reacted to the project, and it was very, very positive from the Mexican students. They, um, they were very happy to be engaged in the project, and we'll look at some of their comments. Um. Erwin, can you um, so, so, obviously, we were interested in what the, the students are saying, and we started to think about reasons why they might um, post the comments that they did. Um, this is a sample one, um, which I'll just translate for people who don't know Spanish. Um, it says, it's, it's very good to, to be able to speak with people from a country as important as England, um, which a lot of British people might find a little bit embarrassing. We might not want to be considered as that important, um, but maybe we are, and it's it's just something that we have to live with. Maybe it's just an expression. Maybe it's just an expression. Or maybe it's just the Mexican students being nice. Yeah. No, okay. most of them feel like that. Yeah. That's but we did wonder whether it could be a reflection of um, this power distance index. I was a bit apprehensive about mentioning Popstead because I know that um, a lot of people like to, to criticize uh, his ideas, and so you can lay into him after we finish. Um, but according to Hofstad, of course, um, countries in Latin America have a high um, power distance index. And we wondered if this might be a little reflection of that. Okay, yeah, um, next one. Yeah. To the next one. 
Um, going back to, to the language exchange, uh, this student has commented on the fact that uh, Mexico environment is an excellent place to have contact with real English uh, and, and not the, the abstract English that they get in the classroom. So we thought that was a, a very positive thing. And a lot of students um, made the same comment. Um, is that enough? Yeah, you know, yes, it was, it was the fact it was more relevant to their experience right. in, rather than the classroom. It made it real, yeah, so that was in. Okay, um, it wasn't all positive. Mm. Um, this student has said that um, it hasn't been very gratifying uh, up to the moment because it was a, a student who didn't receive any replies to the posts that they put into the forum. But I think this was a problem with people starting their own individual threads rather than uh, replying to posts in, in one single thread, which we try to, to encourage them to do in the end. Okay? Um, but this is just a pilot uh, forum that we had, and that sort of thing improved then in, in the post-pilot yes. phase, um, which is Marina. And so the, the post-pilot phase, we now have quite a lot of first-year students involved in it. Uh, the languages students have actually embraced it more than the English students, but there are some students on English degree, both in creative writing uh, and in English, and actually some from, well, many from TEFL as well, English and TEFL, who have embraced this, and uh, they're quite um, excited about it. And we've also discussed in going to Mexico with them, either at Easter or in May, with the Columbus Grant with YEMS. Um, the thing is, what seemed to emerge again, very similar things, but also new ones, and we had a big horror thread, and Stephen King, which, you know, it wasn't expected. And we not planted it, we, well, perhaps a bit with Halloween, I suppose. But we started with Halloween, talk about Halloween, discuss how Halloween uh, is in here and there, discuss the Day of the Dead. But then it became Stephen King, and it became literature, and it became the novels they read, which is, you know, interesting. Um, something else was this American English, British English. And we have a star person who wants to come be here with us, so Rafe Boylan is actually running with this very fast and, you know, all the differences in the English and, and the American English. And also we're noticing that there are major differences between Spanish and Castilian, well, Spanish spoken in Mexico and Spanish spoken in, in Spain. And it's interesting as well, and that's swapping ideas on that. And the other thing is this culture, again, this culture, and, and this is where the, the mismatch and the gap happens a bit. And we'll give you some critical incidents soon. So if you go to how it happened then, we did make it assess because we know our students as well. And only the overseas students or foreign students, the Romanians, are, will do it without assessment. This is, just seems to be a bit of a fact. Uh, and some of the TEFL students are really motivated because they want to, to learn how to teach. They're really excited about teaching online. The other students, they like the idea of the assessment. And... The module, you know, 100, most of you, is linked to digital literacies, is linked to um, competencies for the world of work, is also linked to intercultural awareness. And we thought we would package it all together. So um, this was the assess task, which I also showed to the partners in Mexico. And we kind of agreed it was a suitable task. But I think at that stage, Beatrice and uh, Felipe, our two partners, were not too sure what we meant. Am I right in thinking that? So we were at the same time, you were not sure what we meant. It's only when you saw the products that you realized what we were talking about, probably. But what the product was is also very fascinating. Because this is the perception of culture from our students to the Mexican students. So it's what our students are selling the Mexicans as British culture. Of course, these our students is multilingual, multicultural. So what is emerging is really a big mix, a big melting pot. So the Beatles and the X Factor, uh, a bit in English and a bit in Spanish. So they are trying, this is a bilingual guide, and they why they decide to do the Beatles in English and the X Factor in Spanish is something we have to ask them, you know. How did they choose that? And this one um, is the meta reflection also happened online and was thoroughly documented. They actually presented themselves as a meta-reflective group, which was meta-reflecting on Skype with one of um, your students. We're not naming and shaming anybody. They also created a Prezi. And again, the Prezi PowerPoint uh, presentation 
what they think is interesting in Coventry is very fascinating. Uh, and what they think is academic and what they think, because they had to produce something academic and not academic. You know, the Midland Air Museum, interesting. Midland Air Museum, they think is interesting. You know, I never, never thought that would be my top priority in Coventry, but you know. Um, of course, there is Lady Godiva, there is Peeping Tom, uh, and just, uh, I think we have another one. Very fascinating, I think this is one of the best. So we have Bonfire, uh, Halloween, and the Queen. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's just, in terms of the guide they created for the Mexicans, we're going to interview them a lot. And then, of course, the Mexicans... Languages. Yes. What, what's even, uh, more fascinating? And also the fact that Mexicans kept, kept asking about British cuisine. And we were going to be stuck on that. So <laughs> what we did in the end, we had the breakfast, we had the roast beef, and because this was, this was a question of the Mexican citizens, you know, what is your cuisine like? What are your archaeological digs like? And so the students were trying to address the requests. But of course, you know, they couldn't get many in Coventry apart from the cathedral. So just to give, give you a taste, but of course we're going to try and investigate further this. What also happened as a level of discourse was something, was a critical incident. Over okay. to Zoe. Okay, so I was looking through the um, forums quite a lot, and I came across this one, which we're going to call Student G, and this instance. So Student G starts off by asking, uh, we want to make a blog about Coventry and the tourist attractions there. Is there anything in particular that you want to know about Coventry? So then um, one of our Mexican students comes online, and he's like, hi, what I shouldn't miss from Coventry are there are archaeological zones. So then student D comes back online. No, I mean things you like to do for fun, like play football or, make, or maybe where you like to go for fun. So it's a complete miscommunication. And in fact, what happens is, this is the end of the thread. The student never comes back and the conversation stops. So we start, this is... And we were thinking in terms of modality as well, we want to go into discourse analysis, you know, I want to do the guide. I want you to tell me what there is there you want me to put. You know, it's kind of not very two-way. So, yes. Okay, so we, we had a thought thing then about what was culture, and obviously it meant different things in, for our Mexican students who are predominantly born and raised in Mexico compared to our students who are very <coughs> intercultural and come from different backgrounds. And even a lot of the British students are not originally from Coventry, so it's kind of difficult for them to maybe sell Coventry in the way that the Mexican students wanted it. Um, so, so Ben, how, go on to... Yeah, well, now, the thing is, though, special concepts are about transformation. And also, identification of the learner is about transformation. And what we believe we're trying to do is to get these learners to engage with different discourses, trying to engage in a different way with different people from different cultures. So perhaps at the level of the oscillation in social concept literature, Naya, in terms of social concept literature, there is an oscillation between being beyond the threshold and, be, and after it and, and your liminal, like an adolescent changing. And what happened was, which was very interesting, um, there is some evidence that engaging with this, do you want to do this? Yes? This is the same student G. This is the same student G, and this is a slightly oscillating, transformed student G again. He's realized he's not getting anywhere. So now, what is the culture like in Mexico? What two instructions do you have there? Do you like football? I love it. Change, slightly change. Some of my friends here at Communist and I have created a website that will call Little Offering. Um, let me know if you like it. It's, it's at least a bit of oscillation towards understanding that what he did before, Student G, wasn't really appropriate in terms of interculturally communicating with the students in Mexico. Okay, um, so we, other interesting things happened in. Other interesting things happen in, uh, in TEFL. Elwin. Um, yeah, one of the students, uh, Rafe Boylan, who unfortunately isn't a student on English and TEFL, he's an English and creative writer. And that was timely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if we can poach him. No. Because <laughs> uh, he's been really, really helpful with um, the, 
Mexican students uh, questions about the language, and he spent a lot of time correcting their mistakes and giving them advice on the language. And um, he's probably the, the most communicative of the Coventry uh, students. I just wish he was in town. <laughs> Of course, there is a group as well. The group the interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah there's, there's another group as well who, to be fair to them, they have tried hard, but I don't think they're as um, effective as Ray has been. And, and the Felipe, the Mexican tutor, is actually asking his students to post the, their tasks here. And he's happy for our students to help them and with their English to try and check. And... Um, well, we won't stop there because, of course, this opens a can of worms. So then, you know, he's probably ready to. Anyway, for later. Uh, okay. So the other thing is, though, us as a team. We are reconsidering our own vision of culture. We are reconsidering how we position ourselves. And also, sometimes we, it's like uh, treading on eggshells. Are we going to upset Beatrice if we don't put dear before the email? But here's a... You know, the culture is we don't put uh, dear Beatrice every time, and then sometimes I forget. So really, etiquette in, in the online, this is not contemplated by Byram, but this has really been big in our exchange, both in the forum and amongst ourselves, how we communicate with each other. How do we communicate online in an uh, appropriately, appropriate, interculturally competent way? Um, Technology misunderstanding issues, they've, they've occurred. These were reported by Rubin as well. They've happened on any global exchange. Language is used in different ways. Chat in Moodle is not chat in Skype. Skype is not other things. And then there were a few misunderstandings. Lack of time. We're all very busy academics on this side, and so is other academics on the Mexican side um, with a lot to do. So sometimes it's difficult to to adhere to what we promised each other to do, which was 24-hour reply to any emails we sent. It doesn't always happen. And the time difference, you know, six, seven hours does make a difference because it means with, you know, on some occasions, Paul Beatrice was waiting for me at midnight and I forgot what time it was and vice versa. So, you know, we were there waiting in front of Skype, where is she, where is she? And, and we couldn't talk to each other. Um, so, yeah, so the same for the students. So the thing is, we now, you know, we asked you to define culture at the beginning on your mobile phones. We'll have a look at the cloud which was created. But we're thinking, is culture, you know, is it, trying to define culture threshold constantly set? Should we define culture? Um, and intercultural communicative competence is very problematic because of the assumptions, the cultural frames we all have. Um, and, and the assumptions are quite more visible when you are at such a distance and when you are a six hours distance in communication as well. And also, of course, the values and beliefs exert a very strong pull on the language itself. And, you know, it would be interesting to get help from Bob and Sheen and Hillary. You know, the deep level, the fair cloth, and the also generally holiday, how, how are we using language? You know, how, all the language we've used, what have we done with it? How we done? Considering as well, we are multilingual, multicultural. So there is an, another layer, um, well, many other layers. Now, do you want to be Felipe then? <laughs> we managed to get, that's the only picture we have of Felipe. <laughs> yeah, um, Just, uh, shall I read it aloud? Yeah. yeah. Promoting these types of intercultural communication helps students to overcome stereotypes about the cultures where the language they are studying is spoken as a native language, and about the people who speak that language. In the case of my students, they seem to be more confident using English. They seem to be more motivated because they want to be, to, to be more fluent so that they can communicate with their new friends in England. And in the same way, they are happy that they have helped some Spanish students with problems in Spanish. Now, learning English, has a new meaning for my students because they can see a real purpose in learning this language. They have learned that people in general have similar needs. Coming for us. Yes, I, I agree with him. Yeah. And, you know, this is the positive side. This is how it's seen from the other end. We have swapped the talks, uh, Lisa, but anyway. Um, so this is how it's been perceived as the other end. And this is a positive side. 
So we have to keep in perspective there are very positive outcomes coming out of the project because we tend to be perhaps too meta-reflective and critical. In fact, Elwin is going to conclude on a meta-reflective <laughs> and critical <laughs> note. My own reflection. <laughs> yeah. um, just picking up on a point that we made earlier about the, the difference in, I think, how people conceptualize culture. For the students from Mexico, they seem to be interested in more sort of classical uh, cultural artifacts, things relating to, to the geography and history and the traditions of Mexico. And of course, naturally, they asked the Coventry students about these things um, in, in Britain and Coventry. Uh, but as we saw with student G, possibly they're not that interested in things like this. And maybe there's not much to say about the food in Britain anyway. Um, but we've, we've got to bear in mind that lots of the students here are from Romania. They're also from immigrant families who might not feel very connected to, to Britain and British culture anyway. Um, and for that reason, then, I started to think that maybe the Mexicans were getting more and less culture than they bargained for. Um, more in terms of, okay, they might be learning things about Romania, Somalia, um, Sudan, or wherever the students that they were communicating with were from. Okay, unless, because maybe they didn't get this information about the, the archaeological zones and the cuisine of Britain at the beginning. Later, they did, but at the beginning, um, it wasn't happening. Um, so anyway, going back to, to Byram's uh, guide for intercultural communicative competence, I s stopped on these two questions in, in his guide, and these are basically questions that I've been asking myself um, since I've been involved in the project. And I think those are the questions we're all asking ourselves. So that's where we are. And we conclude with Elwin's conclusions. And uh, it's open for questioning. And do you want to create your cloud? Uh, yes? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Okay. No? No questions? Famous for culture. <laughs> okay, obviously, if there's more, then it's kind of. No. Hilary, I can't believe you haven't got any questions. No, I was no, hoping no. for questions. <laughs> okay. How do you think it will go on after? Because you said they're going to get assessed on it. The students here. Do you think they'll carry on after their assessment? Yeah, they are carrying on uh, via hopefully IMMA. Uh, because Ima is also involved, and uh, she just didn't have time to be involved in the talk today. But uh, she has all the students in Spanish, Abinicio, and uh, also the poste with Mila. They're very interested in carrying on, and this idea of visiting Mexico uh, would also bring it more to the fore if we manage to organize it. We're trying to work on it. So, yes, I think that the only issue, well, one of the issues is that in Mexico, every court changes. And Felipe was very happy that all his students had stayed on, but now he's been told by his boss he has to change group. So he can't, there is no continuity for them because it is university-wide. And that is a shame because apparently the whole of his group continued because they want to continue with him and with Mexico, but now they will have another teacher. It's just a matter of seeing if the other teacher wants to be involved in Mexico and if they want to participate. Uh, but, you know, it's difficult to have continuity over, I think it might be easier here with the Spanish students, but some of the English students, students studying English as well, the Romanians, for example, are also doing it. The other thing which has happened, a little spin-off, we're also part of another intercultural um, project with um, Spain, Germany, and Israel. And uh, incidentally, the students in Israel, half of them are Arabic. They're not, you know, they're Palestinians. So they're Palestinians before I... Mention, we mentioned the, the, the war. But anyway, the thing is, they have crossed fertile lives. So the students here have looked at what the students were doing in uh, Lyon and in Israel and in Germany, and they looked at the blogs 
and they took some of the ideas from them to design their own. So we've had cross intercultural fertilization as well, which has been quite interesting for us. Um, because we weren't very much active in that area, but some students were. Yeah. Um, one of the questions on the survey, and what we can carry mm. on with the interview, is if they took their relationships out of the mm. VLE and into their own forum, so whether they're talking to them on Facebook or if they're using Skype, which we saw in one group, they're already communicating via Skype. So it'll be interesting on the interview stage to see how it's progressed outside of the 100 Dell module. Yeah. Have you found some people that got more into it than others? Yeah. You get some yeah. people who post a lot. So yeah. Be yeah. We have our champions. Yeah. Here we have, yeah. Do you see that as, is that an issue? Or is it just, that's just that they're interested in, so they want to do it? Yeah. That was um, yeah. Well, this brings us back to the netiquette and how to behave in a forum. A lot of them just plonk in an isolated posting. We have to go more into threads. And I, you know, you make assumptions as well. The students who have been on Facebook, all of them are on Facebook, here and there. And they, you would assume they should know about threads, you should know about how you, but no. Everybody throws in something new. So perhaps in the future we'll have to set some ground rules, which we didn't want to. Now, we were trying to resist going in and telling them what to do, but it will have to, to be done for anything, things like that, so to avoid. There are some lurkers as well, like in all online fora. It's, it always happens. Uh, Alec, uh, Andrew, sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, you showed us a slide of the British and American English, and I think that's an interesting area. I just wondered how responsive the Mexican students were to the differences between American and British English, because presumably American English is very dominant in Mexico. It is, but there is also like a national pride uh, in, in opposition to the American English. So they have a stereotype about uh, British culture and British English. They, they may think it is not posh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're quite interested. <laughs> they are more interested actually yes. in, in okay. British English. When, when they hear, well, this is the British pronunciation, they like. I'd say, oh, I want to, to do that. That's quite surprising that. given mm. the, you know, the, the, the image and the message that we get here that Mexicans, you know, one of their ways, that they, want, they want to go to the United States. They see a life mm -hmm. of prosperity in the United States. Yeah. So to kind of buy into that culture rather than the, the British. There are many reasons that mm. make the Mexicans love to the United States, not mm. necessarily admiration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I understand that. I understand that. <laughs> Yeah. When, often when there's a kind of, you know, it's an economic force that drives yeah. makes yeah. people go to a particular country, then they also sub subliminally buy into that kind of cult mm -hmm. cultural that's traffic. That doesn't stop them reacting true. against no, yeah. it. No, it doesn't. But there's, I can see that. That's, but that's why I'm surprised. That, you know, you made it sound quite absolute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolute. But it, for example, in my experience with my students, some of them. Uh, actually, they, they, they produce the American accent. They, they yeah. are happy with that, yeah. some of them. But some others, when they hear, well, this is British, the, the British spelling and British yeah. accent, they say, oh, yes, I like that, they say. Mm -hmm. So it is more positive, in a way, uh, for many reasons, even mm -hmm. historical reasons. Yeah. 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 Because there is this conflictive situation between, oh, the admiration for the state, uh, for technology, for things, and the other, you know, our history. I yeah, I'm, I'm sure that throws yes. a huge shadow over everything. Uh, everything. Yeah. Even yeah. that that conflict makes mm. them uh, uh, reluctant to learn English. Mm. Uh, in some aspects, right. English is a despised language. Mm. But so this is necessary. a way of addressing that, rebalancing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, and but I'm necessary. Yeah. Some of them say, I yeah. learn French because I love it, but I learn English because I have to. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 is, that is huge. Yeah. yeah, and I know from my experience in teaching in Mexico City, I taught for a private language school, and the students we had were stereotypically more affluent, and they came to that language school because they had more um, exposure to British English and British tutors, and they took the British Council exams, right. and the course books were all British. So there was that aspect of like, society that we're looking for that... Yes, yeah. yeah, Sheena, you had the question, but that's the last question, then we have to okay. move on to. Ah, okay, all right. All right, three questions. Oh, well, there's only three questions, okay. Just two things quickly. One thing in terms of your analysis, I think, 
cultural domains has to come in there. You know, if I talk to him, if I talk to him about second language acquisition and learning, we come from the same disciplinary culture. We know what we're talking about, and we can easily communicate. Mm -hmm. If I talk to Indima about what she does at Hockney, she probably doesn't know what Hockney is, and I don't know if she would be able to respond to that. We're from totally different cultures. So I think what you're looking for, what would be interesting here, would be to find out you know, which domains are raised and who raises them and who's able to extend them. And I think the football is one where the person who raised it is looking for a shared disciplinary or sort of cultural domain that, that will, would be internationally comprehensible yeah. and is looking for that connection out that way. So I think that might help in your analysis. But in terms of the implications of the research, the domains that you bring up in a second language are quite different mm -hmm. from the domains that you would necessarily want to bring up in a first language. So it looks to me as if you've got Spanish people raising domains that they can because they're linguistically able to, and English in English, and in English British students raising domains. And, I mean, they, mm -hmm. they've got a much wider scope of choices. Yes. I mean, I've just seen my own yeah, son you can, send entries, yeah. Facebook setting up partners with Facebooks. And the things they talk about, you know, I live in a house with three bedrooms. I mean, that's not the sort of talk no, that teenagers exactly. have. And, but it's what yeah. you can say. It's just exactly. the, the you can see. Yeah. So I think if you look at yeah. who, you know, who raises the mm -hmm. theme and in what language, that will sort of help explain. Yeah. This will also yeah. have implications for teaching mm -hmm. language. I think the things that they want to raise are the ones that should then be coming back into the curriculum. Yeah. We have thought about um, this. So yeah. our students have the possibility to speak and to write in the language they oh, and, and, uh, and more, and, and in more uh, and a simple and form in the other, in the target language, if they yeah. so choose. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 So they, they don't feel restrained to say only what they can say, mm -hmm. but what they want to say. So you think there is a, a pride in the archaeology and the... And the yeah, through the through the analysis, the nineteen participants on the first data, near enough ninety five percent of them mentioned Mexico City and Mexico itself. Um, some of the other topics are very much what we would teach at that level, like your daily routine and your hobbies. But all of the participants all mention at some stage Mexico City and um, the culture and the culture of Mexico itself. Which is quite interesting. Sorry, James, I've got both first. Okay. Have you had a chance to compare purely Spanish for them? Would they do that if they talk to someone else in Spanish? They probably do. Yeah, Bob. Yeah, I'm following on. It's really my question. That's Paul Armstrong. I hadn't realised about the linguistic and pragmatic you know, restrictions are stripped away yeah. because they can select the language. But it really goes to what Elwin said, you know, um, students are, are re British students are referencing things in the culture which are probably more about popular culture mm -hmm. than the kind of more stereotypical issues to do with the culture. You may think of it with the existing Let me just bring that. up the 100. Um, can you bring that's up not a, That's not a criticism of either side. What I think would be interesting, would be, and it goes also to something you said about, you know, having knowledge would be, you know, I don't know if it's part of this, that the British students giving them some kind of knowledge of their own culture. Because, yeah. you know, you, you said there's something in Coventry, well, there's the, there's mm. the old wall in Coventry, yeah. there's some fantastic sites mm. within Coventry. But I think but even Coventry one, people don't know about Yeah, them. and I think one of the things yeah, that came so up... Here, it's quite a rich city, it's got a huge yeah. history. Because they're yeah. 100 yeah. Dell students, they're 100 Dell students, and they started in September, so they're new to Coventry themselves. So it was quite clear from the exchanges that they didn't really know Coventry, there were new students here. Yeah, so maybe we, exactly, it's a good opportunity, or maybe we consider that using students that have been here a little bit longer. Um, so that did come up in one of the discussions about the uh, impact that having 100 Dell students in, that started in September that were new to this area trying to discuss. And, and I think reciprocally, the, the kind um, of pragmatic issue that crop up when British students are communicating with yeah. others, would also be perhaps embedded in the, in the discourse of the Mexican students. So they can start to think about other issues rather than just architecture and archaeology. Other things which are more pragmatic in terms of social, yeah. social relationships. But just to give you an idea how this has evolved, this has become all about literature, English literature and language. And they are now, keep, this is becoming quite a, a big one because Rafe, keeps it up with all sorts of fancy things. And now is sent the picture of Coventry because why? Because Rafe is from Coventry. Yeah, Rafe is the only student I think 
yeah. in Coventry, yeah. but it's really actively taken part. So he's taken responsibility, ownership of his... Coventry. It's the lighting of the lights in the square. This yeah. is Coventry. Yeah. It's Coventry. It looks pretty, doesn't yeah. it? It is Coventry. <laughs> Okay, we probably need to round up because I was be just one time to speak. So, any there was a last question from David, I think. Yeah, I think this relates to what Jean was saying. Maybe, but, um, I think maybe this is part of it. You've over-essentialised these cultural categories from the beginning of British, um, you know, Mexican, and French. You found that it doesn't really work. Because the students like you've associated Britishness with Coventry University, uh -huh. and they don't really work. Coventry University isn't British. Mm -hmm. It's actually already a multicultural, multinational place. It's not really yeah. a country or anything. And so you found mm -hmm. in the southern Mexican. It's, yeah, it's English. looking at the stereotypes that I think the Mexican students have of <laughs> <and> English speakers. <laughs> So they learn a lot on that aspect, but they are sometimes uh, speaking or writing in English to somebody for whom English is not their native language as well, and it is a huge realization. I feel what she was saying, what the, I don't know whether this is what she was suggesting, instead of setting it up as a British Mexican exchange, find a common cultural practice. To, to start it off with, so that yeah. and then find out and but so discover the language. The project it's the day of the dead. The, the day of the dead in Mexico. It was a language exchange, and then it turned up that the Mexicans want, were asking all about culture, and then it turned more into the intercultural exchange. So that part was driven from the students. Interesting, yeah, that was driven completely from the students. Yeah. Oh, I think that it would be more, not really about Mexican-ness or British-ness, but the otherness, the realization that there is an other people, not, not, not uh, something that can be really defined uh, as a homogeneous uh, thing. Ask her for the stick. Can you ask for a memory stick? Close the door. Even for us, which are relatively homogeneous by comparison. And we had a mixture of the Facebook cats and the the cultural thing. So this is the Day of the Dead, and you say it properly, which is a big celebration in all Catholic countries. Uh, and it tends to coincide more with Halloween. Oh, yeah. it just, just a, a little thing. The Day of the Dead goes back to the Aztec culture. So it is not really to the old Catholic but, countries. It's yeah. very Mexican. But in Italy, it links to the pagan rites. Oh, okay. And, that uh, is another. And, and another, and, another yes. Yeah. It is first, yes. It is the 1st yeah. of November. So, so, so 31st is All Saints and 1st of November. So it's All Souls. Yeah. yeah. And instantly we all... Okay. Oh, what can you say? That I am your, your Mexican partner. You are a famous professor. Thank you. And, uh, well, uh, that I'm going to give uh, a general overview of, of my dissertation, trying not to bore them too much. <laughs> okay. Beatrice here. Yes. He's come from, from FETS, Mexico, which is Facultad. Facultad de Estudios Superiores Zaragoza, which is uh, one of the camp, uh, one of the campi in the outskirts of Mexico City, uh, of one of the campi of uh, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, UNAM. Yeah? And uh, she is interested in social concept, I mean, agents, what is mentioned. Agency, that. creativity, autonomy. And She's presenting today a bit of extract and ex excerpts from her dissertation, which she discussed uh, not long ago and the yeah. degree yesterday. And she hopes not to bore you too much, is what we were saying. 
I hope I will not. Yeah? Are you ready, Dean? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay, so I start. Uh, this is the title of my dissertation. As, as you can see, the main concerns for me are the, the knowledge construction how to construct knowledge in the disciplines, uh, specifically in learning in modern languages and cultures. And this construction I am proposing that has a, a pivot learning. Uh -huh. And integrating, I, I, what I'm proposing is that way of constructing knowledge integrates education, research, and human development. The problem, as I see it, is, um, well, what you can see, that the, the, the development of personal epistemologies uh, is not a current priority in most institutions of higher education. They are more concerned about uh, social epistemologies. While the transformative effect of learning is part of a social epistemology, it is important to attest of such a transformation in personal epistemologies. Personal epistemologies, however, are generally considered as being subsumed under social epistemologies, as if the experiential and perceptual transformations of the individual were no more than byproducts of larger interpersonal processes. However, a serious reconsideration of the role of education in personal epistemologies can offer multiple opportunities to investigate the experiential roots of knowledge and ways of knowing conducive to the development of specific fields of knowledge. This would be beneficial for disciplines in general and for modern languages and cultures in particular in terms of gaining a phenomenological perspective of its underpinnings and helping learners to enhance their autonomy and their creativity. We need forms of scholarship for which the human development of those who practice them is not indifferent. The core idea is that the object of study of modern languages and cultures should be literacy in the multi-layered symbolic codes that make intercultural changes intelligible and effective. By taking learning as the axis of scholarship Personal and social epistemologies have experience and reflective action as a common ground. A scholarship of learning is tightly bound to the experiential roots of objects of study that keep on changing in individual and collective histories. A scholarship of learning accounts for the transformation of its practitioner's identity and agency over themselves and their object of study. Such twofold construction orientates a discipline no less than the ways of knowing, acting, and being of those engaged in the investigation. The scope of my research is the investigation of deep learning in literacy. We need to inquire into the experiential roots of identification in a second language literacy in such a way to integrate research and education. My thesis is that modern languages and cultures should not be limited to objects of study such as language, discourse, texts, films, and so on, but has to include the processes of identification of the learner and making sense of his or her experience in a foreign language and culture. I advocate the investigation of the experiential roots of language and culture in a scholarship of learning which seeks to integrate research and education on the one hand and language and content on the other. Experience and learning are subjective, objective processes, and so I advise the epistemological revaluation of subjectivity. I propose that subjectification, that is, the construction of the subject, 
is not only relevant for human development and social well-being, but it is a source of knowledge in the humanities. Uh, this is the thesis. A scholarship of learning languages and cultures is constructed as a form of social and personal epistemology that transforms the agency and the identity of its practitioners. This general statement is broken down into three general statements. Three general statements derived from this argument. The first one is that learning is the most comprehensive form of communication. With the mediation of the world, we learn from each other and educate each other in ways of thinking, acting, and being without which not even disagreement is possible. So we need a common ground. Second, the second general statement is that variability, generativeness, and being experiential transformative are characteristics of deep learning. The third is that according to the previous characteristics of deep learning, the study of languages and cultures has to change its gravitational center from its current impersonal and collective orientation to personal experience and the active construction of identities and agentive voices. <coughs> Each one of these uh, general statements is respectively broken down into three more specific ones, thus making nine steps for the argument. Uh, the first uh, general statement, that is, learning is the most comprehensive form of communication, is broken down in disciplines have an educational genesis. Disciplines have an educational genesis which is generally neglected. I am proposing that it is necessary to acknowledge this origin by investigating the meaning of deep understanding leading into educational practices that are integral to the way of conceiving of the disciplines themselves. The term I use for this investigation and practice of disciplines is scholarship of learning. The second is that the concept of scholarship of learning derives originally from the diversification of the notion of scholarship and then from the critical revision of its historical antecedent, which is the scholarship of teaching. I suggest that the scholarship of learning is the most comprehensive form of disciplinary construction because it is not limited to, to knowledge as a product but includes the processes of knowledge formation. The third is the characteristics of deep as opposed to surface learning are the benchmark of good scholarship interconnected with sound educational practices. Therefore, the critical revision of a specific discipline needs to inquire into this double connection asking how do its basic assumptions posit learnings, learning sorry, and the learners? And the other question is, what kind of educational practices are necessary to improve the construction of this discipline? And when I say this discipline, is any discipline concerned? The second general um, statement, which is variability, generativeness, and being experiential transformative, are characteristics of deep learning. Okay, this is broken down in three, in three sub-statements, uh, uh, which is uh, contextual and self-induced variation is fundamental for discernment. The contextual and self-induced variation of the aspects of experience considered by the learner is foundational for discernment and hence for deep learning. Next is that deep learning is heuristic and creative. That means uh, deep learners learn how they discover ways not only of, uh, to, 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 of knowing but how to know. They are discovering and they create things. So it is no wonder that 
the best uh, person, I mean, that creative uh, writing student was so, so productive in, in our project. The sixth is, through deep learning, individuals transform themselves. Okay, the, the next general statement is towards the active construction of identities and agentive voices. Uh, this is broken down in educational practices that promote the cultural experience of language. This is a highly coded term, the cultural experience of language. Okay, the study of languages and cultures has to change its gravitational center from its current impersonal and collective orientation to personal experience and the active construction of identities and agentive voices. The cultural experience of language is the matrix of generativeness and self-transformation in language and culture. The ability to shift languages in narrated events and narrative actions scaffold literacy in a foreign language. Uh -huh. That is why, well, for me, we are mixing. The students have the choice of, of on what language they are going to write because they can use their, their more familiar language to narrate events and they are experiencing, they, they are making experiments with what I call narrative actions using the target language. Mm -hmm. Next is the meaning of understanding in a discipline unites social and personal epistemologies. I am proposing that the meaning of understanding is a never-ending object of study. Yeah. It goes forward towards the object of study and it goes inward in the way of how can I transform, how I transform myself in order to understand this better, that is. Okay. Now I have, uh, quickly enough, I, I hope, three, the three parts of, of my dissertation, only in, in the three next slides. Part one is the notion of scholarship and its metamorphosis. Part one is an extended discussion of the notion of scholarship and its metamorphosis. With an introduction to the historical origin of the disciplines and their philosophical and political internal forces, I aim at laying the ground for the relevance of the notion of discipline in today's world and of the construction of disciplinary knowledge. Then, I discuss the role of learning as encompassing the foci of the currently acknowledged forms of scholarship. Finally, I discuss the characteristics of deep learning and how they can inform and integrate scholarship with educational practices. Part two, current assumptions of modern languages and cultures regarding variability, generativeness, and transformation. Part two is constituted by a discussion of the current assumptions and practices of modern languages regarding three fundamental characteristics of deep learning, which are variability, generativeness, and transformation. I analyze contextual and self-induced variability as foundational for discernment and hence for learning and the inadequacy of monolingually biased theories to study multilingual societies and the formation of plurilingual individuals. I argue that deep learning implies inventing ways to generate. Even if the language learner generates what has already been known and used. I argue that the investigation of the language learner's identity is transformative to the extent that it is practice and experience based from the point of view of the participant. In this way, the identity of the learner goes from being an acquirer and consumer of a good or commodity, that is, another language, to an agent of her or his own being and means of expression. The turning point to part three 
is to discuss the ways in which deep language learning necessarily affects the notion of culture and its investigation. Part three, the notion of scholarships, of scholarship and its metamorphosis. Um, yeah, uh, part three, uh, that, that was uh, part three. A pro oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Part three, a proposal to develop cultural studies of the person. Yeah, I, I had it mixed it. Part three is a proposal to develop cultural studies of the person as an alternative to their current sociological, anthropological orientation. The main discussion is the concept of cultural experience and its connection with creativity, self-direction, and in the final analysis, with human development. The emic ethic approximation in social studies and the semasiology onomasiology distinction are auxiliaries to articulate the individual's investigation of his or her cultural experience of the foreign language. I propose that literacy and literariness represent different perceptual and symbolic shifts, digital and analog, necessary for the deep learning of a language, and that the ability to articulate narrative events and narrative actions, scaffold literacy and an agentive voice in a foreign language. Finally, I argue that the meaning of understanding in a discipline unites social and personal epistemologies and to the extent that most acts of knowledge constitute a common ground of the disciplines, even if their products are dissimilar, the scholarship of learning constructs its field, establishing cross-disciplinary connections with transdisciplinary perspectives. So this is the final step of a theoretical discussion. It suggests the direction that a number of lines of empirical research could take. Yeah, that's all I brought for you. And I have other slides, but I will show them only if they connect with, with your interests, with your questions. Thank you. Thank you. I think I followed a lot of that, but not all of it, because it's... it's very, yeah, yeah, very it's awesome. very thick. I'm sorry um, about this. I, at one point, I was quite concerned, because it, you seem to be making a, uh, a leap of faith, as you call it, um, that um, the, um, you know, the, using the L1 to create... This is my paraphrase of what you're saying. Uh, you are aware, sorry? In the first... Sorry? In the first what? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know which slide it relates to. Okay, slide, never know. mind. Using, you said something to the effect of, you know, the, the learner can use their own first language, the mother tongue, to create narrative action. I think, Narr terms. Narrative events. Okay. So, uh, it's uh, in terms of the L2, the target language. Uh, it is, I'm talking about scaffolding the, the learning of another language by using narrative events and reflect on them. And then uh, uh, making, uh, uh, well, experiencing or experimenting with a target language using actions. Fantastic. Yeah. What, what I was just wondering about, and I think you got to it actually, was because that's an alarm bell went off in my head actually, was, you know, you know what, what the question is, what are the qualitative differences that that brings into the frame that makes it significantly different from just simply translating? And I think you got to that. I think you talked about that when you talked about deep learning. Uh, the yeah. Process of deep learning. Yeah. Um, but, um, so what is the difference? So there's a more kind of more pressing problem that Ray raises. Yeah. I think that it's fantastic what you said about deep learning about the transformation and everything that yeah. goes with it. Yeah. You know, um, I mean there are questions which I don't quite understand yeah. relating to that. But 
in pragmatic everyday terms, the problem we all have face is yeah. how do you embed that into what is effectively a utilitarian culture, such as higher education, where yeah. there are targets, there are assessment regimes, there are various other things students have to have to do, which perhaps don't fit in with this this notion of deep learning and transformation that you're ref reflecting here. I think there could be a tension between, you know, let's get them on this course, let's get them through, let's get the grades in the, in the process, as against to the very, very, you know, humanistic approach to, to learning that you're actually outlining here. Okay, let me break down your question in two, which is, first, uh, what is the, the, the real difference between what I'm proposing and the translation thing? And narrated events uh, is a way to reflect the person is actually required to, to have a, a journal of it to, to reflect on what is going on, what, what, uh, uh, how can he describe what happened as, as learning, learning the language, learning the, the, something about the target uh, uh, well, culture if that person is immersed in an immersion situation. And the other side, which is narrative actions, is how that person is using, actually, the language. So that is a basic difference. It is, uh, he or she is not translating, but it ha is having like two, uh, two keyboards. One, one uh, to, to reflect, like a narrating, re reflecting on, 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 on the learning process itself, and the other using that learning actually in the language, in the target language. Now, uh, you said, how does this fit into our utilitarian purposes? I would say that we are so much concerned into uh, short-term objectives that uh, uh, they end up to be so fragmentary that uh, students never get there because they are not touched in their internal cognitive and affective needs. So they don't s construct from the inside. Uh, I, I think that it is high time that we reflect on what is the foundation of, of, of that knowledge construction in order to make not like quick fixes in order to get as, as, as soon as possible to the other end of, of, of asking for something. I think you're absolutely yeah. right, but we have yes. real political issue, don't we? I know, I know. But, but uh, I, uh, I, I have found so uh, wasting of the precious time of the students and the, and the teachers and the resources of, of, of the universities attending only to short-term goals. Bye. That, that I really think that we need to move on to something more fundamental, like creativity. I think that is more fundamental. Perhaps not urgent, yeah, but uh, if uh, it is, it, it, it might uh, be good to, to compare urgency with importance. But the, the yes. Of compromise, I think. That, yes. You know, outside really. They can do it, they don't have to do it. They can engage, they don't have to engage. If they engage, I'm pleased, but you know, I want them to be pleased. So that, I think when trying to go into that niche of not syllabus, not module, not program. Yeah. I was thinking about the yeah. project itself actually when yes. I was asking the question, that it does actually it does form a, a, a space where people can perhaps be more creative. Yeah. And more, you know, more aware of what they are doing and more agent if you like. Um, but there's always this tension, isn't there? There's always this tension between the, the people who want us to make decisions and want us to do things which are against our better judgments and what we know and what we know works. And I think we're, this is an example of it. That, that is, yeah, that I think uh, all people who are into education, we have this deep concern that because uh, we are asked to do things that show products in the very short term. And uh, creativity is not something that you can, you can get on demand. Yeah. No. But only when you are creative, you're actually learning, aren't you? Yes. Yes, yeah, I, I just want to know, when, in part one, when you were talking about the notion of scholarship, you, you were talking about disciplines. And yes. my understanding was that you were saying that 
each discipline had its own culture and its own. Um, they were different from one another. Was that what you meant? Uh, very, well, they are, they are different, actually. But uh, what, I, what I mean is that uh, the, the, the crossroads of the disciplines uh, is the uh, experience and learning, the learning experience. And I'm suggesting to use that as pivotal for the construction of a discipline. And then, then I follow the path which I think suits best the, or better the modern languages and cultures as if it were a discipline. It is, I mean, I, it is a, a discussion of its own to consider modern languages and cultures as a discipline or as a collection of loosely connected disciplines. It, it is yeah, big. Was, so when you're talking about discipline, you're not talking about disciplines right across the board. You're not considering physics or... Mathematics. No, 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 no. You're only considering... And then that raises the question, how many disciplines are we talking about here? Well, I, I, I'm, I would say that this focus or this perspective is within the framework of the humanities. Uh, if, uh, the study of languages and cultures for, uh, as, as, as a discipline is usually in the framework of, of social sciences. And I think, how? We can, as humanists, make it within a, a, a different frame where human development is actually a factor, an important factor, not just a, 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 like a side kind of thing. But how can we make it, uh, how can we make the study of languages and cultures in such a way that it is not just applied social research, but human development? Well, it, perhaps not, not here, but in my faculty, when you go for a promotion, you, they ask you to tick which uh, area is, is near, uh, where you belong in, in another way. And they have just, well, among others, which is obviously the hard sciences, the closest to us would be social sciences and historical uh, studies, which doesn't make really sense. Yes, yes, that's true, but I mean, I, I, I have a little bit of a problem with counting straight language learning as a discipline at all. I, I, can, I can tell, yes. Uh, that, that is why I wrote this dissertation, because I, I want to raise the point that learning is a, 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 a a good uh, vantage point. I, I even propose it to be like the most important vantage point to construct knowledge as, so, as a social uh, enterprise and as an individual enterprise too. Because the person is reflecting on the learning. Yeah, I see why. Uh, if it were evident, if it were obvious, then uh, what I did may not make sense. Uh, there is a whole argument behind that. So what you're, it's, the, it's, the, it's what you learn while you are learning that is a value, not the fact that you have learned it. Because clearly, knowing a language is not in itself evidence of engaging with any particular discipline, because people learn languages just by happen chance, just by happening to be in yeah. the right place at the right time. Yeah. It, so it must be, if it's to count itself a discipline, it must be because of the intellectual development that takes place when reflecting on the way that you learn rather than the fact that you have learned. Oh, but there is, that is why I also raise the fact of, of integrating language and content, which, which is... Uh, 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 the, an issue that uh, in the United States and also here was raised with uh, language across the curriculum and more recently language across the disciplines, which makes a lot of sense, where language is not just the means of communication, but the matrix of knowledge construction.
Yes. Very much so. Very much so. So what do you mean by learning? Because actually you're tough, you're You've gone right into the, the field of acquisition, haven't you, really, with this, as opposed to learning. You, I mean, what you're saying is really about acquisition more than anything else. Yeah, uh, and uh, acquisition, uh, acquisition of, of, the, of the language, in this case of the language of a culture, that it can be as well applied to the acquisition of the language of a discipline, which has... You know, students. It, it, it's the the the, the creation of, of 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 the the members of a discipline have to be initiated in a language, yeah, in a rhetoric. That, so. that is why. Okay. Oh. Oh 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 sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you. Well, go to another party.